Hola, ¿me escucho? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Rogelio. The host is now releasing the video. Can't you share your screen, Rogelio? Well, can you see my screen? Yes, now we can see. Yes. Thank you. All right. So, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be once again participating at LACNIC and LACNOG's 10th anniversary. This is a group I strongly appreciate and I participated. I will start speaking on a topic that is very interesting, and this is about subsea cables. I gave this a uh, name which referring to Jules Verne and the subsea cables. Now, the idea that I, that I seek to share with you is that in our region, we have a lot of landings. We are referring to Argentina, Valparaíso in Chile, Fortaleza in Brazil. And there are many countries, and of course, Panama. The idea is to show you what the subsea cables are. This is a very wide topic, and I won't be able to cover absolutely everything. And in my presentation, well, I had to shorten it. But initially, this presentation was much longer. And I hope you enjoy my presentation. And also hope you enjoy this trip along the subsea cables. This is a wonderful type of engineering. Now let us start. I will first speak about the heritage, about the technology, the network topology, the regulatory issues, security challenges, and trends. Subsea cables, for those of you who don't know, are something that date back many, many years. We are speaking about more than 150, 170 years. The first subsea cable dates back to 1840, more or less, to 1850. Rather. And this is quite interesting because 170 years ago, for example, the cables were insulated with a plant that came from Malaysia. And this was like a rubber used gutta for cables. And the wires came from the telegraph. After then, the cable technology evolved a lot. And right from the beginning, back in 1956, when we started using T81 and then T88, which was a first transoceanic cable, it was then that we saw how subsea cables evolved considerably. Now, what is the importance of submarine cables? Many people are not aware that cables in fact, connect 99% of the world. People think that we are connected through satellites, but not. We're connected through subsea cables, through the oceans. We have about 406 cable systems. And as a result of this, we cover of the connections, we cover more than 100,000 kilometers of new cables every year. Now, how is this cable system structured in general terms? The ecosystem has two parts. One is what we called the plant, dry plant, and the other is the wet plant. The wet plant has some elements. They have the cable as such. Then we have other elements which are the repeaters and the equalizers and the branching unit. In the drive plant, we have the 
other elements that have to do with the network equipment, the power feed equipment and SLTE. So this is the connection on the land side. So there are many, many elements. In LACNIC website, you have the details of each of these elements. But for the purpose of this presentation, um, I have uh, shortened it. Now, when data goes through the cables, well, this is the traditional scenario of submarine cables. We have the dry part and the wet part. In terms of technology, we have repeated systems, which are transatlantic systems, or in fact, transoceanic systems. These systems work with chained repeaters and cover about 15,000 kilometers in average. And the unrepeated ones cover about 400 kilometers. And you will see that there is a difference in the optical signaling of these systems. For the regional systems, these include both repeated and unrepeated systems. And these, the repeated are what they call point to point. They go from two to 20 fiber optic cables. And the other have 50 pairs for the transoceanic pairs systems. Sorry, the large majority of systems today, or at least in the most important systems, we have some differences and topologies. We have transoceanic systems, we have point to point, we have ring systems that provide cable redundancy as route diversity. And then we have the fishbone, which has fiber redundancy as a collapsed ring. We have various optical paths, and this serves to do communication along the path, the switching along the path. In order to speak about the cable capacity, well, we measure this as the spectral density times the fiber bandwidth times the number of fiber pairs. This is the cable capacity. There are two important points. There's a limit to the physics, which we call the Shannon limit factor. And as we and we find this as one of the major challenges of the submarine cables, namely, how can I go beyond this limit? This is one of the things that the researchers are studying and what they research. Now, in the past, we had different ways, but now we have up to 24 pairs. Now, for those of you who are in this subject, the variation of the fiber is from another interesting point. has to do with the amount of information that the cables can carry. Today, they can carry much more than 15 years ago. We have transatlantic cables, for example, that have the capacity of carrying 208 terabits per second. So how can we reach that? There are two important things about the submarine cables. One of them is the potential capacity, and the other one is the lead capacity. The potential capacity is the total amount of capacity that would be possible if the cable owner installed all available equipment at the ends of the cable is from one to the other end. And the lead capacity is the amount of capacity of what the cable can transmit. And here I'm going, uh, this is the, uh, a bit of uh, the business background of the submarine cables, the types of cables that are available in our region. The, um, we speak of uh, submarine cables, thinking of uh, the vendors and the sale of uh, the uh, cables. Um, 
the cable is something very complex. It's very difficult to manu manufacture it, both from the technical point of view and from the administrative point of view. It requires a lot of uh, engineering knowledge, material um, engineering, uh, design um, evaluations, and it is very complex also to maintain because there are restrictions at a multinational level. There are cables that uh, leave China and uh, the cable uh, leaves the United States and it needs to go through a number of uh, places. Um, so, and there's a political part that I want to mention, or rather geopolitical, that um, is, um, uh, it involves the regulatory part. Um, it's, uh, there are many political issues and uh, the, then we have the scale of time. Um, contracts may take from six months to two years. So it, uh, that's uh, from, from the concept to the contract in force. And uh, it takes uh, two, about two years and it should last uh, 25 years, but commercially they claim 17 years. So how do we plan cables? We have the business case, the design, pre-build, cable deployment, and maintenance. There are several issues that need to be addressed when you install the cable that involves many areas, many stakeholders to be able to build it. For instance, from the beginning, from the case of the business case, and then the design, and then we have to consider the logistics, install, installing it, and maintenance. This is a very rapid view of what is involved only in the construction of a submarine cable. The, uh, these are uh, the CLS, uh, creation of the routes, uh, developing uh, the routes, uh, uh, submarine uh, routes. Sometimes the cable cannot go through certain places, but can go through others. So the route needs to be designed. There are many factors that need to be developed. And uh, the cable is very expensive. We are speaking of a thin cable. The diameter is not uh, very um, uh, uh, thick. Um, and uh, it's a point-to-point -point, uh, repeaterless system of short distance. It could cost uh, $10 million, and there's a lot of requirements that need to be met. Um, you need to see the system quality that uh, has a lot of uh, requirements, the outages, the plant system life, the redundancy, the capacity, the latency. And also, we need to take many things into account when we install the cable we have to analyze the connectivity. What am I going to connect? What nations, what populations, what people? The internet penetration, the existing connectivity, does it scale? Is there internet connection within the global network, the financial analysis? Is the return on the investment appropriate in what time frame? And um, the Metcalf's law is used um, um, the, the value of telecommunications is proportional to the number of users that will have access to uh, the system, and that needs to be taken into account. How many people is going to provide service to? So it, um, we have the opportunities, the benefits, um, uh, the yields, um, the risks and mitigations, um, the, all the factors that compose the business background, uh, the, the um, the time, uh, the timeline, how long it will be working. So if you can answer all these questions, you're going to see that you should be able to answer all these questions before you make up your mind to install a submarine cable, both for interoceanic and uh, uh, regional cables. You need to see what you need, how we're going to develop it. Uh, mm. These are questions, all of them valid for the different types of cables. Who owns the cables? Basically, until 10 to 15 years ago, there were many uh, stakeholders 
related to the cables. It could be either a consortium or private cables. And uh, in the last 10 to 12 years, some things have changed because some uh, content providers such as uh, uh, Facebook and uh, 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 Google, Microsoft, and Amazon are the major investors. Google has its own cable that goes from Valparaiso to Los Angeles, so that's a private cable. The other part of the cable that is very complex is the regulatory part. The uh, first regulation was uh, in 1984, and from then on, they d there were other legislations uh, that stemmed from that initial, the, for instance, the uh, uh, right of passage for going from one place to the other, fishery zones, uh, uh, economic exclusive zone, uh, you need to, to send notifications, and then uh, the operation of permits, the, uh, the, the, the Coast Guard, and uh, then you have the work visas, etc. Another issue is the network security. How can you ensure the security of the cable? Because the cable uh, is designed to be resilient, uh, but uh, still it breaks. Uh, if you were paying attention to the news, uh, I was in Africa and an Angola operator, there was an earthquake, uh, a landslide, and uh, the uh, cable ruptured. So. No, but the main reasons why a, a cable may fail is because of the fishing activities, or it may also be acts of God, such as earthquakes that I mentioned. So there may be na natural or human-created uh, uh, events. Sharks typically, uh, they say that they eat up uh, the cables, but that's not true. Uh, sharks are... Uh, are not known uh, to bite any cables. It's almost uh, zero opportunity, but still the uh, legend is there. That, But uh, uh, actually, it's more a uh, human uh, problem. Then we have the trends and the challenges in the submarine cable market. What we've done in this market, and this is the most novel thing and the most significant thing, is the so-called SDM. SDM is uh, the uh, spatial division multiplexing. And uh, SDM, the, the peculiar thing about it, um, uh, works in a different way than the fiber. It enhances the transmission. And so you can raise from uh, 8, 10, 14. You get a better yield uh, for your cable. So you don't have so many buttons for and you gain in spectrum so the spatial division multiplexing is a very important trend today in today's market and another way you can get a similar results is with an l band um many people have used it to uh um, but more cables, as in this sketch, you have the same infrastructure, but actually you're using more fiber cables, and that increases the capacity. Another important trend is the so-called the smart cables, the scientific monitoring and reliable telecommunications. Um, if you remember the uh, 2004 tsunami, that uh, collides crashed against the coast and uh, so many people suffered. Well, in that case, the smart cable uh, broke and it was coupled to a submarine sensor and uh, that gives uh, the warning that uh, the tsunami is coming. We can develop more cables and uh, with more sensors uh, and uh, this can potentially save many lives so that uh, and it gives people the time to adopt measures uh, to prevent uh, lives from being lost as happened in 2004. The idea of a smart is to build in sensors that uh, may uh, warn us about things that we want people to know ahead of time. There are several challenges that uh, you have uh, to overcome if you're working with cables. For instance, the uh, um, uh, 
the one of the challenges is whether the undersea fiber communication systems will continue to serve society then to continue an exponential push with more fibers or more cables uh, for instance in africa there's one cable that surrounds uh, the entire continent and it is uh, uh, by uh, uh, Facebook, and there's a Google cable that is also related to the African continent. So we have to develop and to connect people. Uh, connecting isolated people helps them develop uh, themselves. So we, we, our task is to develop connections so that they may connect. Now, uh, the uh, connections are expensive. Projects take a long time and uh, for submarine cables uh, sometimes uh, the project uh, it takes three or four years and it's very expensive very complex and you keep running into challenges when you are implementing so uh, we in order to we have to avoid uh, ruptures and uh, damages i think that it went rather fast but i think i hope that you liked this talk the complete version is in the LACNIC website. If you're more interested about uh, um, uh, uh, submarine cables, there's a summer class uh, in, uh, and uh, uh, I thank everybody, especially LACNIC for, uh, LACNIC for inviting me to this, uh, uh, speak about this marvel, the submarine cables. I want to congratulate LACNIC for the 10th anniversary. Thank you. Can you hear Muchas me? Gracias, Rogerio, Thank you, Rogerio, for your presentation. Carlos, do you want to read the questions? You are the secretary. Yes, I'm going to read them. We have only one by Hernán Ramos, who's writing in Portuguese. And he says, the high cost of the cables um, because of the high cost, uh, not all the companies have the capability to invest in that. Uh, uh, will that contribute uh, to the fact that uh, there is maybe a greater monopoly of uh, large companies such as Google? I don't think so. The, the issue of the submarine cable has always been expensive. And the issue about Google, for instance, um, uh, it... Uh, puts the cable to provide its services and connections. And also the other thing is the cloud computing and streaming. The issue is what people try to do with the cable market is to reduce costs. And sometimes there are partners that uh, collaborate and uh, undertake these things together. So if you look at the global price prices market, you'll see that there's been a drop in the prices. Uh, the more uh, uh, connections there are, the, uh, the cheaper it gets. But now Google is uh, putting together its own infrastructure, but it's not for the market, it's for their own uh, internal service. Here I have a question by Eduardo Preve, who writes in Spanish, and he says, well, what uh, differences in speed either between a cable or a satellite. What's better for users, a cable or sa uh, satellite? Well, today, the differences in speed, there, it, there's a great difference in speed. Of course, the engineering applied in a satellite is completely different from, from what you apply in a submarine cable. But I can say, for instance, that uh, if uh, we take uh, the... Um, uh, if you consider some uh, companies, for instance, that use uh, the uh, space sat, uh, satellites are going to last five years, and, but in five years, they will become obsolete. The cable lasts 25 years and satellites five. And for, for, as the photonic speed increases, then the cables will be able to transmit faster and compete better with satellites. Um, uh, Tupan uh, writes in Portuguese and he says, 
you mentioned geopolitical issues. Could you give examples of some conflicts between countries that interfere in the implementation of submarine cables? Thank you. Yes, indeed. There's one happening right now between China and the United States. Hong Kong. Have one that goes to Chinese territory and these cables have to be moved to other places in Asia. And for geopolitical reasons, there are regulations in place in the United States. There's a group who decides on territorial disputes in the United States. It was decided that these cables can no longer reach those places. And then we have international waters. For example, between Taiwan and China, there we have one of uh, geopolitical issues. 